Welcome readers. I'm Audrey Shipley, the director of the American Library in Paris. We are thrilled for this very special Evenings with an Author sponsored by Grow at Annenberg. Janet Skesley and Charles will be in conversation with Nida Colshaw about her novel about the American Library, the Paris Library. I have two editions right here, very well loved. And we're just so honored and thrilled that so many of you are discovering the library's rich history through Janet's moving story. And I'm proud to say that the spirit that she describes in this novel is very much alive today. We're a thriving lending library, a cultural touchstone, and a meeting place of discovery, both virtual and physical. And tonight is also a special evening because it's our beloved um, programs manager, Catherine Oline's last event with us. She's moving back to the US to become the Associate Director of the Center of Humanities for George Mason at George Mason University. So congratulations, Catherine, we're so proud of you. Um, I know many of you have, I see a lot of people clapping. Um, so many <laughs> have gotten to know Catherine personally, especially over this past challenging year um, when programs went virtual. So Catherine, I really wanna thank you deeply for your, your service to the library and to our community. Um, and it's really a fitting send off because our two speakers this evening are former library staff members. So as Nida said in the waiting room, it's a little bit of a homecoming uh, and a reunion. So I'll let Catherine introduce them. Have a great evening all. Thank you so much for your lovely words, Audrey. It's been really an incredible joy to serve as programs manager for this very special community and institution for the past two and a half years. I could give an entire presentation of all the wonderful experiences I've had and the beautiful moments that we've shared, especially throughout confinement and this challenging year, as you said. But instead, I will just say thank you one more time, very sincerely to all staff, volunteers, library members and supporters, and our loyal event attendees who may be tuning in from the States and have never visited us, but we do hope to welcome you at some point um, to Paris. You can explore our books and our wonderful space, and I think you'll be especially curious to do so after hearing more about us tonight with, with Janet's book and our history. Um, I will miss you all. <laughs> now, to bring the focus back to our two very special, very talented women, we are delighted to be hosting Janet Skesley and Charles in conversation with Nida Kulshaw. Janet Skesley and Charles is the award-winning author of Moonlight in Odessa and the Paris Library. Her shorter work has appeared in reviews such as Slice and Montana Noir. She previously held the role of programs manager at the library. Nida Kulshaw is a workshop facilitator, development, developmental coach, and lecturer at the Grenoble École de Management. She is also a former library staff member, and she continues to create learning environments designed to encourage reflection, self-expression, analytical and critical thinking. Tonight, they will be in conversation about Janet's novel, The Paris Library. I have the French version behind me, by the way, but I did read it in English. Um, it goes without saying that the book, um, which I have read and loved, and many of, many of us on staff have also read and loved, um, is both exciting and precious for our community of book lovers here. We really felt it captured the welcoming spirit we continue to try to embody that was present at the founding of the library, and we hope that will be here with us for another hundred years. So through dark darkness and light, through ups and downs of historical proportions, we hope that the spirit of the American Library continues to thrive. Janet, congratulations on your wonderful book. Not only does it honor our history, but it's already enjoying widespread success. It's a New York Times bestseller, a USA Today and Washington Post bestseller, and its run has only just begun. We couldn't be happier for you and we can't wait to see the reviews that continue to come out and all of the critical engagement with the book. Now, a very warm welcome to Janet and Nida. Thank you both for being here this evening with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Janet! Nida, <laughs> so good to see you. Good to see you. Wow, okay, so family reunion, a little bit of a homecoming, that's what this is feeling like. Um, and I'm wondering if you remember this particular image. Do you remember this? Catherine, could you share this with Janet? It's my little, my little fun image. Do you remember this? Of course I remember that image, yes. How to Hook Your Reader, Writers on Writing, your program, yes. Yeah, so in 2000 and eek, 
2009, you and I um, did a Writers on Writing interview where I sat just like right now physically and we were sitting next to each other in the library's um, room and we were talking about that book at that time and I'm feeling like I'm having a deja vu a little bit, um, although it's virtual. <laughs> um, what I wanted to do was to, just to kind of think about the fact that, you know, what did that, what did it mean for you to be in the library? Um, I remember for myself, a lot of the exhibits that I put together. And I remember one of the exhibits that I put together was sort of inspired by who I call the oral historian, um, the living legend um, of Simone Gallo. And he was really someone who inspired uh, my first exhibi uh, exhibition that I did, one of the very first. And um, do you remember that exhibition? It was I, on. I absolutely do remember that exhibit. I did want to say, though, um, I had such a good time uh, with our interview uh, over 10 years ago. It was something that kept me going and kept me writing this book because I wanted to do it again. And so. <laughs> This means the world to me that you and I are reunited again to talk about my book and that you've put so much time, thought and effort into our conversation tonight, uh, doing so much for everyone, just like you always do. So thank you. Thank you so much, Nida. It, yes, it was wonderful. And yes, you and Simone are really instrumental to this book because you did a beautiful, you curated a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful uh, display, uh, an exhibit on Ruth Burke. Bernie, who was uh, a, a librarian from uh, Idaho, right next to uh, my native Montana. And she had come right after the war. Um, and uh, it was really inspiring to see those black and white photos. And I know how much work you did to get those photos. You, um, you wrote letters to uh, so many people across the United States to, to get those letters and to get that information and put together that beautiful, beautiful exhibit. Yeah, I remember actually that was the first sense of the history. Um, Simone had mentioned, oh yes, and you know, we, we were a lending library in the war. And I said, what? And then he started to show me photos and then it led me to Ruth. And then I discovered more about her history as a librarian at the library. And then I started to feel this history around me wherever I walked in the building. And then I really wanted to get some of her objects and things like this. And so I really wanted the exhibition to sort of show and um, highlight the deep history that the library had. And I feel that that's come through your book as well. Well, ab absolutely. And I have to say, I, I moved to Paris in 2000. I was a member of the library. I volunteered the library. And it wasn't until 2010 when I worked with you at the library that I learned about the history of the library. Hmm. And so it really is through your discussion with Simone, who um, has been with the library since the Nixon administration. He's retired <laughs> now, but um, but he still volunteers. So it is thanks to you and Simone and your conversations. That was really what got me started on researching a little bit about the book and wanting to know more. I still remember the pictures of Ruth Burney. They're just phenomenal. The ones you found are amazing. Well, you, you're mentioning your research, and so I'm going to start kind of diving into a little bit of your process, if you don't mind. Um, for your research process, I mean, where did you pick up things along the way, and where did you start? What was your approach for writing the book, being actually in the library? Well, I was, um, well, our desks were right next to Simone, so I asked Simone about the research, and he said that there had been a writer who'd come into the library, looked at the archives and said there wasn't enough for a book. And I thought, hmm, huh. I don't think so. And so the first thing I did was I went to the American Library um, Association archives and I found Miss Reader's confidential report. It's a 15 page report that discusses um, life under the occupation and and how she how she dealt with the occupation when when the Germans arrived, how she how she um, sent away uh, staff members, uh, the heartbreaks of the library, uh, things like this. And mm. so I that gave me chills. And I knew I knew I wanted to write about her. So really that um, that was really um, maybe the beginning of Miss Reader as a character. And I was, I was going to ask you about that because the book isn't set fully in the library. So 
is there a reason why you didn't decide to kind of make the library the main, you know, sort of focus of the book? I had such a hard time putting words in Miss, Miss Reader's mouth. You know, I'm not on a first name basis with her. <laughs> I still call her Miss Reader. Uh, she will never be Dorothy to me. I even have trouble calling her Dorothy Reader. She's the directress or Miss Reader. So you can see I still, after 10 years with her, I still have this reverence for her. And so it's very, it was hard for me to put words in her mouth. I was so afraid of making a mistake. I really needed a fictional character okay. to really uh, maybe tell the story. And at the same time, as you know, I'm from Montana and I grew up next to a war bride and I've always been fascinated by war brides and really Claudine Maynard, uh, my neighbor is the reason I studied French. She's the reason I came to France. Even as a child, I understood how brave she was to leave behind her friends, her family, her country, mm -hmm. even her language. So I, I always knew I'd write about a war bride. So this is kind of the how, how the story came about through Odile's eyes. And so were the characters already mapped out from the beginning or did some of their connections develop over time or you know, as you were writing in the process? Well, I definitely, I definitely, the more I learned, the more connections were forged. For example, it's very interesting that we're all on a first name basis with Boris. It's the Countess, it's the directress, but it's Boris. And so I was very curious about why we're all on a first name basis with Boris at the library, but not with Miss Reader, for example. And so I met Boris's children um, who are in their eighties now and learned about their father. And so the more I learned, the more he became real and the more he became a character in the book. But I think definitely the research helped uh, forge the characters. And, you know, I, I call, I just use the white pages to cold call people. So they're, you know, with um, last name Nechea, Fricker, uh, uh, Reader, Turnbull, I just called people and tried to track down relatives, Ustinov. Uh, so mm. that was really a pleasure to do. And, and is this actual paper or was it a digital? Uh, it was digital. Okay, it was just digital. checking. Yes, Les Blanche. yes, digital, yes. <laughs> Um, were there um, times when these characters surprised you or was there sort of a twist in the road that you can share with us or one or two of them? Well, um, I have to say my main character Odile died in the first five drafts of the book. So it surprised me that she survived. <laughs> uh, I was, you know, I wrote, I wrote towards the end where she, where she would, where she would die. And uh, so it really surprised me when I just had this flash that, oh, she needs to live. So that was definitely a big surprise, but I don't like killing people off. Uh, so I was, I was just very glad that she did survive my writing. Um, okay. Let me see. Uh, I really, I really enjoyed writing about, um, about the different the different characters and I actually wrote to the uh, library in Berlin to find out more about Dr. Fuchs, mm. uh, Bibliothek Schutz, the, the Nazi library protector and I had this image of him in my mind and I was really surprised to see the bland photo of him. So it, it didn't match what you were thinking? No, no, because <laughs> so it was very sometimes it was very interesting to put a, a name to a face. Yeah. Um, and was there a moment when you thought, mm, maybe this isn't going to make sense or mm, maybe I have to rethink this idea? Was there a, a part where the revision, redo, maybe throw this out, maybe bring it back? Was there certain sections or a part that you can share with us where that might have uh, shown up for you? I think I always had faith in the story, just be not because it was my story, but just Miss Reader is so incredible. You know, she came to Paris alone in 1929. Uh, she, the American ambassador told Americans to leave the country. She remained with her staff. Everything that she did for the soldiers, 100,000 books sent uh, from September 1939 to May 1940. How can you not love this person? Hmm. Um, I well, recently- Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I recently wrote uh, an article for Lit Hub and they used a document from the American uh, Library in Paris's archives where um, Miss Reader assures people, assures staff that when they are forced to flee Paris, there will be chocolate. 
that's the first item of food on her list. So how can you not love a woman who puts chocolate at the top of her list? But in, in terms of doubt, you know, Nida, I think you and I have talked about this. Uh, I, my original agent uh, didn't want to go out with this book. My original editor didn't want to acquire the book. The book was, uh, the book was rejected twice by my French editor, once in 2016, and then when it went to auction in London, she wanted to read it again and she rejected it again. Um, so it was really hard. I, 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 um, I queried 75 different agents, five at a time. Uh, so that, I guess, if there was a moment of doubt where I was thinking, it, not that it wouldn't come together, but just that it wasn't going as smoothly as I would have hoped. That, mm. would, that would be it, more the business side than the, the heart of the story side. Well, what I'd like you to do is bring us into Odile's world. So would you mind sharing a passage from the book? And also, I believe there's some images that you're gonna share with us as well. Yes, I'll start with a passage of the book. And this is just chapter one with Odile and it's Paris in February, 1939. Numbers floated around my head like stars. 823. The numbers were a key to a new life, 822. Constellations of hope, 841. In my bedroom late at night, in the morning on the way to get croissants, series after series, 810, 840, 890, formed in front of my eyes. They represented freedom, the future. Along with the numbers, I'd studied the history of libraries going back to the 1500s. In England, while Henry VIII was busy chopping off his, head, his wife's heads, our King Francois was modern, modernizing his library, which he opened to scholars. His royal collection was the beginning of the Bibliothèque Nationale. Now, at the desk in my bedroom, I prepared for my job interview at the American Library, reviewing my notes one last time. Founded in 1920, the first in Paris to let the public into the stacks, Subscribers from more than 30 countries, one fourth of them from France. I held fast to these facts and figures, hoping that they'd make me appear qualified to the directress. I strode from my family's apartment on the city route of Rome, across from the Saint Lazare train station where locomotives coughed up smoke. The wind whipped at my hair and I tucked tendrils under my tam hat. In the distance, I could see the ebony dome of the Saint Augustin church, religion 200. Old Testament 221. And the New Testament? I waited, but the number wouldn't come. I was so nervous that I forgot simple facts. I drew my notebook from my purse. Ah, yes, 225. I knew that. My favorite part of library school had been the Dewey Decimal System. Conceived in 1873 by the American librarian Melville Dewey, it used 10 classes to organize library books on shelves based on subject. There was a number for everything, allowing any reader to find any book in any library. For example, Mama took pride in her 648 housekeeping. Papa wouldn't admit it, but he really did enjoy 785 chamber music. My twin brother was more of a 636.8 person, while I preferred 636.7, cats and dogs, respectively. I arrived on the Grand Boulevard, where in the space of a block, the city shrugged off her working class mantle and donned a new coat. The coarse smell of coal dissipated, replaced by the honeyed jasmine of joy, worn by women delighting in the window display of Nina Ritchie's dresses and Kislov green leather gloves. Farther along, I wound around musicians exiting the shops that sold wrinkled sheet music, past the Baroque building with the blue door, and turned the corner onto a narrow slight street. I knew the way by heart. I loved Paris, a city with secrets. Like book covers, some leather, some cloth, each Parisian door led to an unexpected world. A courtyard could contain a knot of bicycles or a plump concierge armed with a broom. In the case of the library, the massive wooden door opened to a secret garden. Bordered by petunias on one side, long on the other, the white pebbled path led to a brick and stone mansion. I crossed the threshold beneath French and American flags flittering side by side and hung my jacket on the rickety coat rack. Breathing in the best smell of the world, a melange of the mossy scent of musty books and crisp newspaper pages, I felt as if I'd come home. Mm. Cool. I think that's how I felt when I walked into the library. I had that same, <sighs> that's exactly, I think, what I did. <laughs> so you have some pictures that you were gonna show us? I do. 
Let's, I'll do my best to, to screen share, so bear with me. So here we are um, with the Paris Library. And this is a map of Paris. So hopefully with my pointer, you can see this is the, the Saint Lazare train station. Mm -hmm. And this is the Saint Augustin church that, uh, that Odile would have seen that I just described. And we can see the, the library is not so far here. There we are. So this is the library in 1939. Staff come from the US, Canada, Russia, France, Switzerland, and England. Our story starts here. I have to say that uh, these days, the staff is just as international and, and speak just as many languages. <laughs> this was one of my first finds online. Uh, I spent my days at the Bibliothèque Nationale reading the Paris edition of the New York uh, Herald Tribune, reading back issues of library journal. Uh, I just wanted to know what life was like for librarians in 1939 and 1940, what their concerns were. And then in the evening, I would go home and I would keep researching. I would look up, I would look up Dorothy Reader, the American Library in Paris. And so this was one of the first things that I found online, this beautiful information card about the library with its, um, with its address on the Rue de Téhéran. I love that there are only four uh, digits for the telephone number, 2810, uh, and there are so many buses. Um, <laughs> very interesting, not as many buses today. <laughs> This is a photo, you can see it's the same photo. Um, this is the inspiration for my character, Margaret. I love the wide brim of her hat and I wonder what secrets she's keeping. <laughs> I bought this um, from the Chicago Tribune. So it was really in, in Googling nonstop everyday archive, are adding their scanning information and putting it online every day. Uh, there, there are just more things put up on the internet. So this was one of my finds. This is another one of my finds. This was a photo that I bought off of eBay for $24.99. It just stuns me that our history is just floating around for sale on the internet. Um, this is Dorothy Reader. And as I said earlier, she came to Paris alone uh, in 1929. She started at the period in the periodical room and she worked her way up to the role of directress in 1936. On June 12, 1940, just before the Nazis invaded Paris, she sent her staff away for their own safety, but she remained at the library. She dealt with Dr. Fuchs, the Nazi library protector. The Nazis had pillaged the Russian, Polish, and Ukrainian libraries in Paris. Certain people may not enter, he stated, meaning Jewish people. So Ms. Reeder and her colleagues delivered books to Jewish members. I will say that I'm very glad that the librarians of the American Library in Paris today do not have to get up on chairs um, to do publicity photos. Um, it's more about the minds, so that's, I love that. Here's another photo. Uh, this is Clara de Chambrun, one of the original trustees, along with the writer Edith Wharton. During World War II, she was the only trustee to remain in Paris. The others returned to the safety of the States. She was summoned to the office of the Nazi library protector as well. The ALP had been denounced because its collection contained anti-German journals and cartoons. Here we have Boris Nechayev. He uh, lied about his age uh, to join the army so that he could take part in the Russian Revolution. He and his brother came to Paris hoping for peace, but instead found themselves in the middle of another war. He arrived in Paris in 1925. He worked at the library as a page and worked his way up to head librarian. Originally from Russia, he spoke several languages. During the occupation, the Gestapo shot Boris and took him prisoner. Uh, he survived and worked at the library until he retired. Here he is holding uh, his daughter Helene in his arms. I was thrilled to be able to interview her for the book. Uh, he was shot through the lung and uh, Helene was in the next room when it happened. 
Uh, she said that he made a full recovery and never stopped smoking his beloved Jeton cigarettes. You'll notice, um, you'll notice that uh, he is standing in front of the library. You can see um, from the picture that I showed you earlier. Um, so you can see where, where they're standing. And here we have a photo of the staff. Uh, here's Dorothy Reeder and every picture I see her in, she looks a little different. Here's Boris again. Here are the Canadians, Evangeline and Olivia Kernvold, uh, a mother-daughter team. I absolutely love that there was a mother-daughter team working at the library and uh, I'm missing my mom and thinking how wonderful it would be to work with my parents. Uh, it would be lovely to see them every day. Here is the library love story, Helen Fickweiler and Peter Ustinov. I was able to interview their daughter uh, and granddaughter for the um, for the book and uh, their daughter Elizabeth was helpful um, to the library. She was able to identify some people in the archives. Cool. So how how after you found all of those images and you've dug deeper into the history and what were the I, I like books because you can have history show up in different kinds of ways. Sometimes it's a quote that someone says, sometimes it's a, something in the newspaper that a character reads. Um, can you give us some examples of how that history sort of found its way into the book? Well, I really looked at so many photos and I really wanted to incorporate what people looked like or how they held themselves or um, to, show, to show how they, um, how they how they were and who they were at the time. So I also um, I also just did a lot of research. I, for example, one of the things I was surprised to find out was that uh, germs were an issue even in 1939 or 1940. I think of germaphobes um, as some fairly recent concern, but there were they were worried. People were worried about the transmission of germs through books then. Um, I. It was very interesting to read the, about the quirky um, patrons of the library in the 1940s. <laughs> um, having worked at the library for two years, I can say there are still quirky patrons. <laughs> and it's always very interesting to see the stories. I felt very lucky. One of the things I based um, the book on was my own history at the library. Um, I think you you had the same experience. We uh, organized events in the evenings and there were always the same groups of people. So we had our habitué who would come to every evening event. And it was really reassuring because um, when you work as the programs manager um, and just like you did uh, as well, organizing events, you're throwing a party and you don't know if 10 people will come or if 120 <laughs> people will come. And you want the best for the speaker. You want them to have a full house. And of course, it's, it's hard in Paris because if there's a spring night and everyone wants to walk along the Seine, then too bad for your speaker. And so <laughs> it's very reassuring to see those habitués and to, to have those members come to every event and know that you could count on them. And the same with the volunteers. So that definitely made it into the book. Mm. And so um, now that the book is out in the world, does it feel different? from what you'd imagined um just wondering if there was a you know after the struggle of getting the yes and now that it's out how does it feel well it's really lovely i received a letter a few days ago from a woman who uh, lived through the occupation she was six years old and she uh i i talk a little bit about the exodus uh the people from from the north and the east of france who marched through paris and so she said that she lived through that experience herself with her with her mother where the where the german planes um shot at people on the road so people had to get off the roads and she, she said she remembered her mother covering her with a handbag so when you receive letters like that uh, where where people who were there tell you that you got it right it's extremely gratifying Oh, thank you. And so what I think I want to do now is open it up for questions. Um, Catherine, do you have a few to pass along? Are there any questions there? 
Yeah, I actually have one already. Um, well, thank you, Nida, for, for moderating this wonderful conversation also sure. with Janet. Uh, it's been lovely to listen to you both. And I think that's a great idea. Let's go ahead and open it up to the audience. Um, so I invite anybody who might have a question to submit it via the chat feature. And I'll go ahead and read through as many as time allows this evening. So the first one I had already was from Laura, who's wondering, was Charles Glass's book, Americans in Paris, helpful in your research, Janet? I remember reading it when it came out and I thought his bibliography was was very helpful. It, it pointed me in the direction of Shadows Lengthen, for example, mm -hmm. the book that was written by the Countess. So yes, absolutely. I think I depended more on, I probably read about 10 books by women, um, memoirs written by women who were in Paris at the time. There was a, a, a gutsy American woman who was married to a French man and they lived in Paris. And when he was called up, she followed him to the, um, to the um, army base. So every time he would change uh, army bases, she would just go along with him. And her, um, her notes at the time were impeccable. And uh, her, I think it was her daughter who actually got the book published. She, um, no one wanted the, the book. I think she was trying to get it published in the 80s and there just wasn't an interest in the war then. So uh, it was very interesting to have that. Boris's mother-in-law kept impeccable notes and Boris's daughter, Hélène, transcribed the, um, the note, the diary from Russian to French and she typed up the, she typed up the notes. So really I was looking more for the experience of women during war and people who had actually been here. So that was really my, my inspiration. There were a couple of um, American journalists whose books I read uh, who covered the war and were here. And that was really a big inspiration to me. Okay, great, thank you. Let's move to another one here. We've got plenty to choose from already. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Emily is wondering, um, what was the biggest surprise you came across in your research? The biggest surprise I came across in my research, hmm. I was, I think when you are looking at, at World War II, there are so many interesting facts and people are so interesting. You just wish you could put everything in. So I just wish I could have put more facts, more information, more, more people in the book. It, it just was, I, uh, people had such interesting lives. And uh, for example, I don't have Hilda Frickert in the, in the book and it's a real pity she was the secretary. And I, so it just was seeing all of the people who worked at the library and worked so hard to make sure that there was this feeling of camaraderie at the library. Great, thank you. All right, so let's take a, we've got a staff question, which is always fun. So we'll take that one from Celeste, who is asking, which of the characters in your book is most faithful to the real person, as far as you could tell from your research? Um, you know, Boris's son read the book. Uh, he's French, but I sent him a 400 page manuscript. And he said, despite the fact that it was in English at, and 400 pages, I read it in four days. And he said that he felt like I captured the spirit of his father and of the library. Boris's son worked at the library as a teenager and his daughter, Hélène, um, uh, spent a lot of time as a child in the library. So when they said that I got it right, uh, that was really gratifying. Okay, thank you. Uh, one from Carolyn here. Why did you decide to write a novel rather than nonfiction? Well, as I said earlier, it was very hard for me to put words in the mouths of, of the different characters. I, I just felt such reverence for them that for a long time, their characters were very wooden and they didn't seem like real um, round characters. So having Odile as my, as my um, narrator allowed me to talk about the library in a way that maybe I wouldn't have if I had felt so constricted. Great. Now we've got a couple here that are kind of along the same lines. I'm going to try to combine these here. Um, I mean, you were very open about the fact that you have received rejections um, for the book in the past. And so people are sort of wondering, you know, why this book is so amazing. How could it have been? Like, how could that happen? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we've got we've got some of these messages are coming in privately as well. Um, anyway, so we have someone who is wondering if you're comfortable, um, if you could share some of the reasons that any of the initial agents or editors had rejected the book. Um, and then 
Yeah, another person who's just saying the book is wonderful and immediately enticing. So she finds it hard to understand why it would have ever been rejected. Uh, well, as I as I mentioned earlier, um, when we were in the green room, uh, no one wanted it until everyone wanted it, and uh, and that's that's just sometimes how things things go. Um, some agents didn't like the lily sections in the 1980s. And for me, the whole point of this book is the trend and the whole point of libraries really is protecting stories and the transmission of stories and the transmission of facts and the transmission um, and, and the memory of, of what has happened. And so to me, Lily is really the embodiment of, of the characters at the library. And in, at the end, when she when she is speaking, she says things that Monsieur de Narcia said, things that that Paul and Eugenie said, and so she's never met these people, but yet they live inside her and they live through her. And uh, but some people wanted a, a straightforward Paris story, and uh, I just couldn't bear to cut those cut the 1980s section. Great. So this one, I think, is from someone who may have read the book or is at least very familiar with the story here. So Sarah's wondering, when Miss Reader was summoned to Mr. Fuchs' office, what happened? And was there scrutiny of staff as they delivered books to Jews? Did any staff who, who did this um, write a, a memory or a memoir of their resistance? It was, it was the Countess who was summoned to Dr. Fuchs' office, and it was because the library uh, had been denounced for having the um, having anti-German uh, political cartoons. And so the Countess wrote uh, about uh, delivering books and about having Boris and Peter, uh, whose photos I showed you earlier, um, carrying books as well. And I think it was just an obvious solution for the staff. And a lot of times with um, World War II, people don't really write about it because they don't view it as being heroic. They view it as being decent human beings. And we don't really write about being decent human beings very often. We just take it for granted mm -hmm. that this is the way we should behave. Right, that's a really good point. Um, here's one from Evelyn who's wondering if any of the research you did involved the ALA, the American Library Association archives. Absolutely. As I said earlier, uh, the first the first place I looked was the American uh, Library Association archives and the, the Miss Reader's uh, report, uh, which is marked confidential, is actually online. It's available online through the ALA. And that report just gave me chills. And so with Nida's research and Simone's research uh, and Miss Reader's report, that was really the genesis of the book. I received uh, hundreds and hundreds of pages from the ALA. I, I asked them to scan uh, the entire, all, all the boxes of the American Library in Paris. Um, correspondence in the 1930s and 1940s and even the 1920s. So I went through hundreds of documents, hundreds of letters. Great. So we've got a, a character question here. These are always fun. Um, do you think Odile would have been able to adapt to Paris after a 40 year absence if she came back? Oh, I think so. Absolutely. I think I think Paris doesn't change so much. <laughs> All right. Oh, I, I love this one. OK, I think um, I relate to this as a reader of your book. So we'll we'll see how you feel about this one, Janet. So Kim is wondering, after all the time um, with the writing of the book and trying to get it published, you spent a lot of time with your characters. Now that you have shared them with all of us, do you miss them? <laughs> um, no. <laughs> Happy to leave them in the past. That's that's a totally normal thing. No. I think. Well, I think they just they live inside me. So they're they're with me. They're a part of me. So um, I don't think I miss them because I don't think they're gone. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense, too. OK, so Melinda here, she says, I love the other storyline that was in the 1980s. How did you decide to write in that time and in that part of the US? Well, I'm from Montana and my neighbors in Shelby, Montana um, are from Freud, Montana. And Freud, as we all know, means far cold. And I love the idea of a Parisian coming to Montana and living in a town with a French name. And uh, so that's where Freud came from. I also love that it's, it's pronounced like Sigmund Freud. Um, 
so that's that's the the beginning of where Odile lives in Montana. I love the 80s. I grew up in the 80s and I just love all the songs. I love the styles. I love the way that kids could be independent and parents kind of left them alone. Uh, so I wanted to write about all of those things. And uh, I also wanted to write about the Cold War, which is such a very strange period. And for those of us who grew up on the plains, there was, you know, the nuclear missiles that were planted like potatoes. Um, Lily points out that um, once detonated, they could um, they could they could hit Russia in a matter of thirty minutes. The time that it would take Odile, uh, excuse me, the time it would take Lily to get ready for school in the morning. So I really wanted to write about uh, a period in the United States of uncertainty where we was where we weren't sure about what would happen next. I wanted to. Um, the book in 1939 opens with a lot of uncertainty. We don't know what will happen. Um, there's a tense political situation, but it was the same in the, in the United States. Uh, the book starts with the Soviets shooting down a passenger plane that was going from Anchorage, Alaska to Seoul, Korea. And there was a, there was a feeling of just not knowing what the Soviets were capable of. Okay, I do see one here that's a little bit of a spoiler, so I'm going to skip that one. Um, we did have a request for no spoilers coming through the chat a little bit earlier, so we will move on from that one and instead take this from Ling, who's wondering, um, so after working hard researching in the archives, what did you find most interesting about interviewing the children and grandchildren of the librarians? I assume those were two kind of very different processes for you. Well, what surprised me the most was Boris's children. One would say something and the other would say, oh, I didn't know that. Or, oh, I hadn't heard that. And when they described their father, it was like they were talking about a completely different man. And Helen said it was because she was born before the war. And so she had memories of the war and the deprivation after the war. And her brother was born during the war and had no memory of that time. So she felt like they were different generations, even though they were just a few years apart. And so talking to them and listening to their different stories and points of view about their father was really fascinating. And I think that's true of all of us. I mean, we have the same parents, uh, we siblings have the same parents, but in a lot of ways they don't have the same parents. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So we've got another question here about your next project. I know that honestly you have so much going on right now with just the success of the book and its promotion, but do you have anything on your mind um, that you might be writing next? And then someone is asking specifically, has something caught your interest? Well, I'm always, I'm always writing. I'm always writing, but I don't like to talk about my, my projects until they're more concrete. That is completely fair. <laughs> <laughs> we will eagerly await to see what comes next. Um, okay, I'll wait for a few more to come in. I'm sure people are kind of busy typing. That's kind of the, the unfortunate thing about Zoom is we have to type out all of our questions. It's not as spontaneous as a live conversation. But in the meantime here, I wanted to ask you, Janet, um, if you had recommendations for those of us who are local, where can we pick up the book? I, I know that Penelope is in the audience and I have been to the Red Wheelbarrow and seen it proudly displayed. Um, maybe you just wanna speak about kind of local booksellers or where people can, can find the book. Well, absolutely, yes. Uh, of, of course, the, the Red Wheelbarrow, I sign many copies and Penelope kindly has four different editions of the book in English, which is really wonderful of her. Um, I, I, think, I think the book is, is sold in, in all of the, 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 the bookstores in, in, in Paris. I think that's true. Although WH Smith right now is closed for remodeling. Yes, I wanted to go before I left and it's, oh, yes. it's truly it's been for shut renovation. for a couple of months. Yeah, it's closed for renovation. Yeah, yeah. It's open in April again. Yes. Exactly. So any of the English language bookstores and, and I imagine as far as the French edition, it's sort of widespread as well. I mean, I've seen it in FNAC. I'm not sure where else um, many of the, the bookstores are carrying that as well. Oh, yes. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Fantastic. Okay. What's, Another what's interesting about the French edition is that it's called a thirst for a thirst for for books and for liberty. Yep. And it's right because here. Paris does not. I think if you slap Paris uh, on a on a book in America, we are intrigued because we're we're very interested in the city of lights. But Paris does not sell in um, in France. And also the problem of 
of uh, library. It sounds like librairie, which means bookstores. So the title just did not work in French, but it came out at a time when we did have a thirst for books and, and liberty because it came out during the confinement when the bookstores were closed. So I thought that I thought the editor, um, Veronique Cardi was uh, perfect in her title. Absolutely. And that's that's kind of inspired a question here about the translation. Um, we have Susan who's wondering if, if you've read it in French um, and if how do you feel about the translation? I know it's been translated in many other languages as well. Maybe just speak a little bit about how, how it's been um, to, to see it translated. And if you've worked with any of the translators, that type of thing, we'd be curious. Well, I love working with translators and it really is a great joy to work with someone who pays such attention to your words. So it's really, it's really an honor to have to have exchanges with translators and without translators I don't know where we'd be. Uh, this translator um, died, he handed in the manuscript and he died and so I was very sad that uh, I wasn't able to thank him for his work. Um, one of the interesting things about the translation and something that we English speakers don't have to worry about when we're writing is when to go from the formal vu to the informal tu. And so uh, it was interesting to me um, because that's not a choice that I ever had to make or something that I ever had to think about. But for example, um, for the Spanish translator, she started everyone out at the library, all the colleagues with vu. And then as the situation during the war got more and more tense and the librarians had to draw closer and closer together, they changed to the informal too, which I thought was a really wonderful thing to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. I think we'll be able to take just a few more here. We've gotten a, another sort of flurry of questions coming in. So let me do my best to get through these. Um, so Lisa is wondering, in your research, how did you find the strength of women just before the war? How did I find the strength of women? Yeah, I guess she's sort of wondering whether that's something that comes across in the book or did you find that the strength of women was an important part of the war effort maybe? Well, I, of course, I think that the, the role of, of, of women has been um, systematically erased in history. And so it was especially important to write about the female librarians at the American Library in Paris. Dorothy Reeder came to Paris alone at the age uh, um, at a very young age in 1929. Uh, she worked her way up to the role of directress. She led the library through very difficult times. The um, Countess carried on at the age of 70. Uh, she slept at the library with a mattress uh, to keep it safe uh, from the Nazis. Uh, so it really, they're, they are really incredible. Um, uh, the the secretary, Hilda Frickert, accompanied the countess um, when the countess was summoned to the, um, to the office of Dr. Fuchs at the, at the uh, Majestic Hotel. Um, and she, uh, her sister was actually sentenced to death. She was a resistant. And uh, so these women are just absolutely incredible. Yeah, thank you for sharing a little bit more about that. Um, we have a comment and question. I, I sort of love this one. Okay, the use of Dewey Decimals added a humorous and nerdy, I think, I think this person means that in the best way, humorous <laughs> and nerdy elements to the book. Did you have them in the original draft or did you add them later? Oh no, it was right away. That was the first line, right away. <laughs> okay, what else are we seeing here? I should say, I should say that Simone Gallo uh, checked my numbers twice and was, was very, very helpful. Um, very, very helpful. Yeah, that's great, thank you. Um, so we have another question from Laura, who's, who's wondering, has there been any additional interest in the American Library in Paris from, from the French media since the book was released? And Audrey, our director, has kindly stepped in already in the chat and said, yes, thanks to Janet and her French publisher. And I remember a lovely event that, that we had done with you and some, um, some French journalists. Um, maybe you just want to speak a little bit about that experience or kind of other events that you've, you've done or interviews you might have given with the French media? Well, there was, yes, I think there was an article written about, uh, about the library um, in the Figaro, and the Figaro also reviewed the book favorably. Uh, there were several reviews about the book where they talked more about the library than the book. So I think it speaks to, um, 
I think it speaks to how important the library is and how important the library was during wartime for people. Um, and it's it really been a pleasure to see uh, to see it written about in in the French press. Great. And now this doesn't necessarily concern your period or your novel, but maybe being a you know a history buff of the library, you might be able to comment on this. Um, someone's wondering what happened to the original building of the library. Oh. <laughs> it was so sad. I went to the. It was just. It's devastating to go to the Rue de Tehran and see everything intact except the except the um, the library. And I actually heard from a a, a bookseller uh, who I think she became a bookseller three years ago. She works at the Place Ronde a bookshop in Lille, and she actually works um, in the in the new glass building where the library was. And I think it's. I think like Dannon has its headquarters there now or did recently. And she said that from her office, she could look down and she could see the um, see the courtyard that is in the front of the book. So I guess that courtyard is behind is still behind the, the glass building. But of course, the original building is gone, which is a real pity. Right. Okay, well, we're just about coming up on time here. So Janet, I thought we might close with, with um, something that's been a little bit of a tradition for some of our authors that we've been hosting, especially virtually. Do you have a book recommendation for us? <laughs> oh, I, you know, I, my favorite book of all time is Bel Canto. And I just love how in a very tense situation Anne Patchett brings together these disparate people and really shows us how much we have in common. Thank you. That's a really good tip. I read that years ago as well, and it's kind of stuck with me. So wonderful recommendation. All right, great. Well, thank you, everybody, for your wonderful questions. This has been a, a really fun event. There's been so much engagement. Of, of course, it, it makes sense. We are the American Library. You've written about the American Library. It's, it's just been really a pleasure to host you, Janet, and you as well, Nida. Thank you for yeah. your questions and the conversation. Yeah. Um, do you mind if I ask a couple of questions? I want to finish it. I want to surprise Janet. I think, yeah, we've got time. We've got a, just a couple of minutes. So feel free to jump in. Yes. Oh, okay. Here we go. So to end the evening, Janet, if you remember this, um, mm -hmm. we did this at the end of Writers on Writing a million years ago. This is how it feels. And it was um, something that I pulled from um, Bernard Pivot's program, Apostrophe. And now I can actually pronounce that much better than I did in, in 2009. Um, and so at the end of his interview, he would ask a list of questions. Now in the States, I saw this as, as something that happened in, inside the actor studio. And so I have my short little questions, my list of questions for you. And so here we go. What was your favorite book as a kid? Oh, Charlotte's Web. What? Okay. Love that. What section of the newspaper do you read first? I would say the obituaries. Can you tell me why? Because people live incredible lives. All right. If you could choose any story to live in, what story would that be and why? Any story? Well, that's such a good question. Um, and to live in, you have to really like it. Yes, you really do. You really do. <laughs> I can't say Bell Cantor. That was a hostage situation. <laughs> I like the writing, but oh, gosh, I don't know. You know, I love, um, I, I recently discovered Anne of Green Gables and it just seemed like such a nice, gentle place. So, All right. What inspires you to sit down and write? I just love the, I just love observing people and noting what they say and noting what they think it's really a pleasure to just sit and reflect um what was your best subject in high school it was not math <laughs> okay um, but I, I did enjoy math I was I was terrible at it I I loved I loved literature I loved French I loved art and to end what is your favorite motto we write to taste life twice by Anna Nin. oh Thanks, Janet. It's always great to see you. And thank you, Catherine, for putting this together. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you both. That was so much fun. I love this rapid fire interview at the end. You surprised me as well. But Janet, you seemed totally prepared. Like you were 
just completely ready to go with it. I love it. So thank you for, for adding that element for us. That, that's a really nice personal touch. And I think all of us now as former staff members, we will continue to, to celebrate the book. And now you've had the chance to introduce it to our community and hopefully many, many more of us can read it in the next couple of months here and continue to talk about it. So thank you both. All right, thank you. Bye thank everybody. You. Good evening. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to close out then with a few more words about the library. Um, so I think Audrey had mentioned in the beginning, but the American Library in Paris is a nonprofit institution and we do welcome donations. So typically in person at events, we, we would, um, would love to see about 10 euros per person per event from people. If that's something that you're interested in doing, you can still support the library now online. So I've sent out a link to a donation page. Um, it went out in the same email as the Zoom link. You'll find it just above. And if you're interested interested in supporting us, please give it a click and find out more. Um, but our events are free. So if that's not something you're interested in doing, please, no pressure. It's just a reminder that we, we are a nonprofit, that's all. Um, and before I let you go, we have a wonderful kind of array of events coming up in, uh, in March. Yeah, we're almost to March here. I guess that's next week already. So I invite you to check out our programs calendar online. Um, if you've enjoyed tonight's event and you might want to kind of shop around and sign up for some other events we have coming up, we would love to see you again in the audience. Um, as well as check out our YouTube channel. So we have all of our past events um, from this year and even some from years previous on there. So you can find out uh, more about other authors that we posted. And then once again, thank you to Janet and Nida for this wonderful conversation and to the audience. I wish everybody a very nice evening or rest of your day. Take care, everybody. Goodbye. Bye.